Good morning. Good morning, and it's good to see you, and it's good to gather together on this icy, rainy, sleety day. I'm actually thoroughly impressed at anybody who traveled to get here, because uh, it looked pretty bad out there, but now we got here safely. Uh, our programming note, our pianist lives in Adams, Mass., so he called me up and we agreed it was best for him not to uh, make the drive, so... We get guitar music today, and uh, I know there's a few others that weren't able to make it, so we'll keep them in prayer this morning as well. Well, as we begin our worship, let's turn to the call to worship from Isaiah 55. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Seek the Lord while we may be found. Call upon him while he is near. God's word shall not return to him empty, but it shall accomplish that which he purposes. For you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Let us pray. Father, Son, and Spirit, we come to You. We are thirsty for You. We are hungry for You. But we have nothing on our own. So we come open and empty-handed looking for You to fill us up. We are seeking You, Lord, while You may be found. We are calling upon You. So would You please draw near to us. Lord, we may come uh, this morning with our faith filled up and feeling vibrant. We may come feeling dry as a bone, but we may be somewhere in between, Lord, but we come to you no matter who we are and where we find ourselves, because you have found us here. So fill us up with your spirit as we praise your name, as we pray to you, as we hear your word, as we share our hearts and lives. So come and be pleased with our worship because of Jesus, we pray in his name. Amen. Well, let's sing a couple songs together. Jesus, all for Jesus found in your bulletin. Please stand if you're able. Let's say Jesus, all for Jesus, and the words are found in your bulletin.
please turn in your hymnals and remain standing if you're able. And let's turn to Redeem How I Love to Proclaim a Thumb on hymn page 282. Redeem How I Love to Proclaim a hymn page 282. <laughs> Savior Jesus Christ, He shed His blood so our lives can be redeemed from being lost. We are found again. So let's take a few moments this morning to confess our sins to the Lord. Because the scriptures say, Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call on Him while He is near. Let the wicked forsake His way and the unrighteous man His thoughts. So we are invited each day, and especially this time in our service to take a moment of silence, to forsake our wicked ways, to let go of our unrighteous thoughts so we might be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Let's take a few moments in silence. Oh Lord, there is much we have thought and said and done that has fallen short of your glory. We have left things undone that you would have us to do. And we feel that weight, but help us to feel your grace all the more. Lord, we, we know your word makes much of sin, but makes even more of Jesus. So help us to do the same. Help me and help us, Lord, to acknowledge our sin, but to embrace Jesus all the more because of the redemption we have in him. So thank you for your forgiveness, which your word says, let us return to the Lord that he may have compassion on us and to our God, he will abundantly pardon. Thank you that you are our father of abundance. In Jesus name. Amen. amen. Let's join our voices once more in song and sing, I surrender all. You may remain seated. Uh, it's found on him, page 393. I surrender all. Him, page 393. And we're going to sing verses 1 through 3. If you sing verse 4, you're going to sing a solo. <laughs> verses 1 through 3 on I surrender all.
Well, that was an unintentional tribute to the Billy Graham, who, as you probably saw in the news, was uh, has passed away into glory this week at age 99. As far as I know, and maybe some of you uh, were at some of his rallies, and um, they would sing that song quite often toward the end of of his rallies to invite folks to come and surrender and accept uh, the Lord. And uh, I was never personally able to attend one of his rallies, but of course his ministry uh, has its, had its effect uh, on my life and ministry as well. So we thank the Lord for, for Billy Graham. Uh, but at this time we will have our scripture reading from Mark 4, 1 through 20. And we've been going through the book of Mark and we come to the chapter 4. And it's the parable of the sower. Mark chapter 4, 1 through 20. Yes, Alita. Sorry, I neglected to call you up. <laughs> Come on up. Thank you. Uh, and Alita will be reading for us. And so please turn in your scriptures or your inserts. And let's read Mark 4, 1 through 20. Good morning. The parable of the sower. Mark 4, 1 through 20. Again he began to teach beside the lake. Such a very large crowd gathered around him that he got into a boat on the lake and sat there while the whole crowd was beside, was beside the lake on the land. He began to teach them many things in parables. And in his teaching he said to them, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell on the path and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and it sprang up quickly since it had no depth of soil, and when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. Other seed, other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. And he said, let anyone with ears to hear listen. The purpose of the parable. When he was alone, those who were around him along with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. For those outside, everything becomes in, everything comes in parables in order that they may indeed look but not perceive and may indeed listen but not understand so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? Then how will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones on the path where the world is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground. When they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy. But they have no root and endure only for a while. Then when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are those sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word. But the cares of the world and the lure of wealth and the desire for other things to come in and choke the word and it yields nothing. And these are the ones sown on good soil. They hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. It is true. It is trustworthy. And we look for it, the Spirit to use it to change our lives. And we'll be looking at that passage a little more closely in a few moments. Well, at this time we have our opportunity to contribute to the work of the Lord for our offering. If you are a guest, please do not feel under obligation. But this is our opportunity to give our tithes, gifts, and offerings to those of us who are part of this church family for the work that God is doing here. So will the ushers please come forward this time. Be my 
Yeah, sometimes this is our actual our garden, right? So we throw out some leaves in the garden. What do you think would get these? What do you think would happen with these? I think some chickens might come in. <laughs> and then I, it was too nasty out there for me to bring the chickens to okay. this morning. But I was going to bring these, and I'm pretty sure they would eat them right up. So the chickens and whatever else would eat these right up. So would they have a chance to grow? No, no chance to grow for those. And then what do you think would happen with these? you think there's enough dirt in there? No, not quite enough dirt in there. There's too many rocks. So they would, they would grow up a little bit, but then once things got tough, they wouldn't really grow very well. And then this one, there's a little dirt, but mostly sticks and thorns and thistles. So they might grow some, but they would not be very healthy either, right? So, and then this one, what do you think would, work, what do you think would be happen with this one? Yeah, it would grow really well. It's got good soil. Like, it should be right in the middle of the soil. I'm so back. <laughs> so, well, why would Jesus tell a story like this? He was trying to teach the people and teach us too about what happens when we hear God's word. So this, these seeds, Jesus wanted us to think of as God's word, or the Bible, or even Jesus himself, because Jesus called himself the word. So, God's word is in the seed, and if it lands on just the, the stairs or the path, it might get snatched away. <coughs> so maybe if somebody has a seed that lands on a cold heart that doesn't want to hear, it'll get snatched away. Or if it lands in rocky soil, it might grow some, but then when trouble happens, like the hot sun or maybe a, a lot too much water or something like that, it wouldn't grow, right? So Jesus said, be careful how you hear. Because if you hear and you receive the, his word, then you will grow and, and he will grow you and you'll be fruitful. That's really something. Where am I going to something.
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let's look at the word once more this morning, and please open your scriptures or perhaps your inserts to Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 20 that Alita read for us. So as we begin, I've got a, I've got a question for you. Does anybody know who this person was? Does anybody know who Mordecai Ham was? Mordecai Ham is a funny name, I don't know. Who is Mordecai Ham? Okay, somebody does. I believe it was Esther's uncle. Nope. Oh, well, that was the name. That's where the name came from. Oh, okay. But there's this a gentleman that lived not that long ago. And I didn't know who it was until I had to look him up. He was the guy who was preaching when Billy Graham came to visit. Oh. So, almost nobody has heard of Mordecai Ham. But because of his, well, because of the Holy Spirit, of course, but the Holy Spirit used him to plant that seed in Billy Graham. And as you've seen the news, perhaps this week, he, he just recently passed into glory. And uh, apparently, he shared the gospel with more than anyone else in human history. I would believe that because we got a lot more people uh, around than we used to. And he, uh, according to the calculations, he preached to 215 million people live. Uh, plus however many saw them on TV or whatever. 215 million people. Uh, in part due to that seed that Mordecai Hannah planted when Billy Graham was 16. So the seed is the word of God. When we, we read the parable, I won't read the whole thing again, but uh, Jesus gives a, a, a now famous parable of the sower broadcasting the seed to wherever. It almost seems perilous to us, right? I'm just going to put it wherever, it doesn't matter to me. That seems kind of wasteful, right? To just, you know, wouldn't we want to prepare the field properly and make sure it doesn't go out on the path, it doesn't get in the rock, get out the rocks? And, well, God's way is not necessarily our way, but before we get into the seeds, let's, or to the soils, let's remember what the seed is. The seed is the Word of God. That's what Jesus tells us. The seed is the Word. Which is shorthand in a sense for the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And uh, when we look in the Gospel of John and other scriptures, Jesus himself is called the Word. So Jesus, in a sense, you can think of Jesus himself is the gospel because he is our Savior. So let's remember what the seed is, but also remember what the seed is not. The seed is not a nice uh, experience. The seed is not necessarily a, a nice group of people. You know, we, when we think about, okay, how, yeah, at least I think, and I know many of us do, um, think about how are we going to make a difference in this community as a church? How are we going to grow our church and, and be healthy and strong? And how are we going to do that? Well, here we have it right in front of us. It's the word. It's the word. It's not necessarily uh, being a nice place or having a be friendly people, although that, that helps. <laughs> but it's the word is the thing that that will grow, not anything else. So when we think about this sower who we know is in, in the in the parable. The, the sower is Jesus, right? He's sowing the word. Or, are we willing to, to sow as recklessly as Jesus did? Because you know, Jesus keeps going back and forth with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were the religious leaders of his day, as you may know, and they were very strict, and, and they, they kept bumping up with Jesus. And uh, somebody pointed this out. You know, if the Pharisees controlled the sowing process, they would try to cut their losses, right? And they would dr dramatically limit where they were sowing. So they would probably exclude the rocky places. They would, they, the Pharisees wouldn't be doing that, but they would exclude the lepers. 
and the sinners, and the tax collectors, and the outcasts, they would say, I'm not going to waste my seed on that. Well, as it turns out, the Pharisees were the hardest soil that there was. So when we, uh, when Jesus calls us to be broadcasters of that seed, just like they called uh, Mordecai Ham to sow the seed of, that came into Billy Graham's heart, when, when he calls us to help in that sowing process, are we willing to sow as recklessly as Jesus did? And just, and in a sense, uh, without prejudice, right? We're just going to sow the word wherever, however, when you know, think about, I don't want to extend the metaphor to, to the breaking point, but uh, think about seeds. You know, we have the sunflower seeds, which we're playing with, with, with the kids. You know, the, the birds will eat the sunflower seeds, and maybe they'll digest them, maybe they'll not, they'll, they'll, they'll spread and emerge just through a relatively normal process. But what are some other kind of seed, uh, I guess seed delivery mechanisms, right? I used to, uh, I'll give you an example. I grew up in South Florida. So some of our seeds are like literally coconuts. <laughs> and the coconuts would, you know, maybe go down the river and find a new place to be or whatever. Um, but then when we would visit up north here, we'd find these little helicopters on the ground, which we never had in Florida. And we start throwing them everywhere. Of course, they're common as anything up here. There are the, there are the, the uh, maple seeds. What are some other, I mean, open, open question here. What are some other types of seed delivery mechanisms that we have out there? Squirrels. Squirrels, yeah, that's a good one. The squirrels will gather the, the acorns and put up a bunch of them in the pile. Some will get eaten, some will won't, some will sprout. Right? Birds. Birds, right? Birds will eat something and they'll they'll deposit it with a little fertilizer, right? Dandelions. <laughs> Dandelions, I like that one, yeah. They, the wind will catch the seed, that's very uh, you know, that, that goes in line with this, the Holy Spirit, right? The spirit is the wind. I got I think I've got an answer brewing over here here in the front row. Yeah. Milk weeds. Milkweeds, yeah, those are a lot like uh, dandelions. Yeah, with dandelions. Yep, dandelions. Um, what else is there? I thought of another one. I can't remember where I put it on. <laughs> oh, when we walk the dog uh, in a mile around woods, you know, we have this white fluffy dog, as you may know, and it was totally muddy. So then we had a brown dog. <laughs> and we had, a, we had a muddy brown dog because he just decided to lay in a puddle. So, alright, why am I going off this list? Well, first of all, nature, God's creation is just amazing, all these different ways. But that, I think that's a hint that there's a lot of different ways to deliver the seed of the Word. There's not just one way. You know, I mean, my opening example was a preacher preaching so that the Billy Graham could uh, receive the Word and flourish. So this interaction that we're having right here, here is one way to deliver the Word. Stand up in front of most people and talk about it. There's lots of different ways, though, to deliver the word. Not just one person standing in front of a group. It's, it could be even more effective. And maybe it would be more effective in many of our lives to just have a word with a friend or a family member. And, you know, it might seem awkward to be like, <coughs> you know, I've been thinking about this situation, and that really reminds me of, of this uh, verse that I came across. Do you mind if I read that to you? Or maybe write it in the note or something like that. The, the word of God is, is powerful. And 2 Corinthians 9, 6 is like this. <clears throat> the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, but whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let's, as we think of being broadcasters of the seed, let's sow bountifully. So now let's get to the soils, okay? I'll get my little examples out here again. You might not be able to see it well up there, but... And I'm gonna put it there, I'm gonna get too dirty. So I'll have to you can set it down here. So, we've got the path. All right, I was gonna bring a brick in, but it was super muddy and wet, so I didn't bring the brick in. 
Um, so the path where the sower is broadcasting the seed and it lands and the birds immediately devour. And Jesus later said, when the disciples were like, huh, what does all this mean? Um, Jesus said that was Satan taking away the seed. So, story time here. There once was a man named Job, whose old friend Nancy had died. So he went to the funeral in a church he'd never been in before. The preacher spoke about Jesus, something about dying for his sins, if he'll believe in him. It made little or no sense to Job. He never gave it a second thought. The birds came and snatched up the good news before it had a chance to sprout. So somebody put it like this, the soil along the path serves as a warning that Satan is a danger to anyone who will hear indifferently. Satan is a danger to anyone who will hear indifferently. If we hear without a second thought, if we hear indifferently, we are in danger. And we all probably know somebody like this, because it's, it's common, right? Do you know someone who you know has heard? The life-changing story of Jesus. But it seems like I remember your glue every single bounces off me and sticks to you, right? Did you hear that? Yeah. So it just bounces off some of our hearts and some of our loved ones' hearts. And it, it, it breaks our hearts to know this is the life-changing message of Jesus for eternal life and a full life here and now. Forgiveness and joy and, and peace that is, that is for you and through the word of God. Why don't, why is this not taking? We're, we're not necessarily given a why, but we do know that it does happen. And there, there's a little bit of, that's not the end of the story. We'll get back to, to the east, the east of these difficult soils in a minute. But so that was the path. The rocky ground. I've got my little cup full of mostly rocks and a little bit of dirt. You know, the, it springs up, there's no root, it, and it withers. If someone receives the word with joy, but it withers from tribulation or persecution. Alright, another little, another little story. There once was a woman named Sarah. She had a challenging childhood and adolescence. And out of the blue, her best friend, Lindsay, became a Christian. And then shared the gospel with her. The life-changing message of God's love for her hit the mark and she became a different person. She was growing in her faith by leaps and bounds until a few months later when her health declined rapidly and her husband left her. She couldn't grasp why or how God could let this happen. Her faith faded and she fell away. So someone put it like this, the rocky ground serves as a warning that one's faith must run deep if one hopes to endure the coming trials and tribulations. And we, we want our faith to grow so we can endure the trials and tribulations. Sometimes they'll come right away, so we don't necessarily have time to, to grow in a, in a safe, so to speak, period. But we want to receive the word and let it grow deeply in our hearts. Now, do you know someone whose faith is like a ball rocket? Where it skyrocketed with joy and then the tough times came and they fizzled and fall to the ground. Or maybe, you know, maybe as I describe these things, I'm using terms like, do you know? Maybe you might even find yourself in some of these positions. And uh, there, there is a word of hope that God has for us, even if we find ourselves in rocky ground, because Jesus can transplant. Right? So I will get to that a little, in a little bit, but I think we all probably know someone whose faith shot up with joy and then it fizzled, and we it also breaks our hearts and say, Jesus, why is this happening? Well, he doesn't necessarily answer why he just keeps going. So the thorns. I, I didn't get any actual thorns, I just got sticks, but uh, the thorns is a good it's a theological conundrum, which uh, I don't think we're going to too deeply right now. But the question is, do the thorns are the thorns actually the people who are growing up amidst the thorns, are they in faith? They're just not fruitful? I don't know. But it, they do grow, but they're choked out. So there once was another man named Job. He grew up in a religious household, but never, it never took root until much later in life. 
and he began to grow in his faith. After college, Mike got caught up in sin of various sorts, but after a while, God rescued him from his sin and his destructive lifestyle, and he, he repented and was changed by Jesus. His faith grew, but the enemy kept attacking his weaknesses, and Mike never really fought back. His desires eventually won him over, and his faith was choked out. And do you know someone like this guy who, whose faith seemed vibrant, and, but maybe there was a dark side that he didn't know about until it was too late? Where his faith was choked out because his desires for other things overwhelmed his desire for God. Or maybe you're one of these three. If, if you're honest, the soil of your heart right now might be the path. Or feel like you're just vulnerable to the word just being plucked away. Or maybe you're in the rocky soil. You don't feel like there's much depth in and you're starting to feel the heat. And you're starting to feel withering. Or maybe you feel the storms around you and they're starting to choke you out. If you're there, the question I have for you is, do you want to grow in the healthy soil? If you're there, you want to be in the healthy soil. Well, Jesus doesn't go into it right here, but we have other scriptures that, that support this idea of transplanting. If you're, in the, if you're in the rocky soil, Jesus is a good gardener. He can transplant you from the rocky soil to the good soil. So if you want to grow and bear fruit for Jesus, he's ready to transplant you even now, if you receive his word deeply. Now, all of these three happen every time, all the time. We don't know why. Only God knows. That's why we scatter the seed and we pray. Psalm 126 says this. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. So, all right, that was a lot of bad news. I'm sorry. It's just the way the parable set up. Three quarters bad news. And now the good news of the good soil. Hearing the word, accepting it, and bearing fruit with a miraculous yield. Did you notice? 30 fold, 60 fold, 100 fold. That's miraculous. Like, I looked up what I could find about you know, how farming worked back then, and maybe like a 7 or 8 fold yield was like really good. So a 100 fold yield was like literally miraculous. There's no possible way that human beings could do a hundredfold yield. So when the, the seeds go into the good soil, Jesus says, well, in a certain sense, yes, three quarters of the, of the soil conditions are poor, but the miraculous yield of the good soil more than makes up for that because there's a hundredfold yield. So there once was a woman named Florence she grew up going to church, and when the time came, she received God's word gladly and began her journey of faith following Jesus. She led a rather normal life as a wife and mother, an active member of her church and community, but she had an undeniable zest for life and love for Jesus. Always singing and often praying, she passed her faith down to her children and grandchildren, some of whom are Christians even now, and some who aren't yet. Or there was another woman named Alice. At an early age, she knew she wanted to be a foreign missionary, and she fulfilled that calling as a single woman on a missionary team in Chile. She and her team led many Chilean children as well as adults to faith in Jesus over many, many years. These two women are women of my family, are part of our heritage. And we stand, I stand here today doing part to the soil that they had in their hearts because they received the word gladly and they followed Jesus and they bore God for the fruit in them. So some of us are called, like Grandma Alice, to go to the foreign mission field and proclaim the word to people you never would have met otherwise and see fruit. Some of us are called, like Grandma Florence, to Continue to be faithful wherever you are and plant the seeds in your family and friends wherever you find yourself and anywhere in between. 
So the different, now I don't talk much about language and grammar of the scriptures here, but this time is really helpful because when we see the words in the original language about hearing, you know, I, I circled uh, on my copy here, I circled hearing, there's lots of, it says hearing a lot in this in the scripture, right? When it says hearing for the path, when it says hearing for the rocky soil, when it says hearing for the thorns, it's the once and done type of word, type of word. It's called an heiress, if you want a little brief lesson. The heiress tense, it's once and done. These, these bad soils, it's the once and done here. But the good soil, it suddenly shifts. If you were reading in that language, you would have noticed the change. It's not the once and done hearing anymore. It's the hearing and keep on hearing. Hearing and keep on hearing. Receiving and keep on receiving. Bearing the fruit and keep on bearing the fruit. The difference, one of the main differences between being in the state of the bad soil and being in the state of the good soil is are you continuing to hear and to receive? How do you be fruitful? Receive the word deeply and continue to hear the word. Hear and keep on hearing, which is in contrast to the ones in the receive and keep on receiving, which is in, in, in contrast to just having it bounce off of you. Bear miraculous fruit by receiving the word. Now, one thing that I think sets us free, we can we can uh, feel under a certain burden. Okay, I've had a good, uh, God's given me good soil, and I'm thankful for that. And so now I better get on, get on the stick and uh, bear some fruit, or God's going to be unhappy with me, right? <coughs> no, that's not, that's not how it works. Because, uh, trust me, I fought that, playing myself. Where I say, okay, God's given me so much, so I better do the right thing, or, or I'm going to make God sad. That's not how it works, though. God bears the fruit. He's calling us to be faithful. He doesn't call us to be successful, though. You know the difference? Can you tell the difference between being faithful and being successful? Sowers, somebody put it like this. Sowers are not called to be successful, but to be faithful. To be faithful, to keep on receiving the word, and, you know, we talked about in Bible study this past week. What would it look like if we continue to grasp the Word and to, to fall in love with Jesus, to understand the Gospel more and more and more? We would receive more and more power as we continue to trust. More and more fruit. Now, this parable ends... And we're left with, you know, okay, who am I? Where am I? Well, how, God, how are you going to bear this fruit? And uh, I think to, to kind of complete the story, we have to keep reading the story. We have to keep reading the gospel. We have to keep understanding the gospel. We have to keep hearing the gospel. And in John 20, or excuse me, John 12, 24, Jesus said this. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So, brothers and sisters and friends, do you want to bear much fruit? Jesus says, come and die. Come and die to your own sin, to your own self, and come alive again with fruitfulness. As somebody put it uh, like this, and I'll conclude with this word. And he was, uh, it's actually Charles Spurgeon, who's, if there's, if there's any patron saints of Baptists, it's Charles Spurgeon. So, um, he was a fabulous old preacher, and he had this devotional that somebody shared with me. And he was talking about um, the apostles, uh, Andrew and Peter. You know, when Jesus, I mean, when was this not that long ago? When Jesus was calling the apostles, the disciples at the time, it said, hey, Andrew, follow me. And Andrew followed him. Now, now think about it. So those of you who may be familiar with the stories of Scripture, does Andrew ever show up again? Anybody know any Andrew stories? No, there's really no Andrew stories. But what, what did Andrew do? This, if you look at that story, you know, I would forget it, but it, it was 
was pointed out to me. The only real story we have of Andrew is that he went to Peter, his brother, and said, Hey, Peter, we found the Christ. <laughs> Let's come on. And then, of course, if you're familiar with the scriptures, Peter was the number one disciple. Well, this is how he concluded. Dear friend, you hardly know the possibilities that are in you. You may simply speak a word to a child, and in that child there may be slumbering a noble heart that shall stir the Christian church for years to come. Andrew didn't have much talent, but he found Peter. Go and do the same. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the seed of the word that you have given to us so graciously. Help us to receive it by hearing it carefully. Let it sink deeply into our hearts. And Lord, if we find ourselves uh, on the hard or stony or thorny soil, would you transplant our hearts into the good soil? And would we repent and believe and follow you? And Lord, as we find ourselves in the good soil, would you be faithful and bear fruit. This, this story has a promise of being fruitfulness, of, of bearing fruit. So help us to bear fruit as we look to you, that we might see the joy of, of others coming to know you, and others coming to faith. Would you bear fruit more and more and more, here and now, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Show us, even today, who we might share even a small word with. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's conclude our service by singing together. The marvelous grace of our loving Lord. It's found on page 250. Grace greater than all our sin is another good word. Hymn page 250. And we're going to sing verses 1 through 3. Please stand if you're able. Marvelous grace of our Lord.